Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here. Got Stacy with me. Hey y'all. We're up here on section nine, I believe, of the similitude of Hermes, uh, similitude nine. What are we talking about this time, Stay? We're talking about those 12 women in black. Oh, we're talking about the negative, talking about them wicked women this time. We're gonna give def we're gonna give definitions about who they are. Yeah, we're gonna talk about how they uh relate to the tribulation, how they relate to today, how you don't want them and you how we need to be learning to put them off. And we're gonna go on and talk about the the foundation stones and who those guys are and what it means to get the seal of God. Yeah, we're gonna talk about water baptism, we're gonna talk about uh the uh, 12, the 25 that came before us, the 10 that came before us, and the uh, remaining ones uh, that came after them. All right, I hope you get something out of it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lord, we ask you to help us to complete this class according to your will. Let us say only those things you would have us to say. Bring to attention those things that we need to know in order to have a good class and uplift your kingdom. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so be it. All right, now that last section took a pretty long time. I don't think we ought to spend as much time on these negative women. Maybe okay. we can finish out this section. Okay. All right. Um, where are we at? 144. Okay. 144. Here now said he the names of those women which were clothed with the black garment. Of these, four are the principal. The first is perfidiciousness, the second, inconstance, the third, infidelity, the fourth, Pleasure. All right. Now, just like we said about the other, uh, the positive virtues, these have four that are the chiefest of them too. These are the strongest of the twelve, and these four um, are are dominant. If if you can't get away, in other words, if you can't get away from these four, then the other eight are going to take over your life. Okay. Well, since we're slowing it. Going a little uh, faster with these, we're going to just name maybe two characteristics of each of these uh, words. Okay. The first, perfidiousness. Um, from my definition, I have treacherous and deceitful. All right, over here on Google, when I put in perfidious, it says, if someone accuse, accuses you of being perfidious, you should probably be offended. It means underhanded, treacherous, deceitful, even evil. Yep, that's what um, I got treacherously. Yeah. All right. So a person, a person is treacherous. So that means that you know they're actually working against the children of the. They were actually working against the servants of God. Actually, working against the Father. Even you know, actually doing stuff. So I can see why this would be the the chief is of them all. Perfidiousness when you know they're actually being treacherous towards other people. Mm hmm. Yeah, chief is of all. Um, so how do you uh, put that with the tribulation? Well, in the tribulation, remember, we're going to have floodwaters of hate, floodwaters of greed, floodwaters of deceitfulness. So if the tribulation is pro promising to be a time full of deceitfulness and hate, the person who himself is perfidious is going to be the leader of the bunch. He's going to be the one, you know, carrying the torch down the road, you know, looking for people that he can target to whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The next is inconstance. And for that, I have no restraint. It being the opposite of consonance, which means uh, having self restraint. Incontinence means you have no restraint. So looking over at Google, it's talking about a urinary incontinence or something like that but you, the one you're talking about is like a lack of self respect a lack of self restraint yeah. so if a, if a person and we talked about this in the other part when we were talking about the positive ones you have to have self restraint in order to take advantage of the positive virtues so a person who doesn't have any self restraint you know they're, they're not going to resist stuff like sadness or malice or anger or foolishness Th those elements are going to be a part of their life Yep, um, I can see how that is definitely going to um, be a part of the tribulation, how it's not going to be good during the tribulation if you have incontinence, no restraint. Yeah. All right, let's go on to the next one. Infidelity. Infidelity. Uh, and I have the state of being an infidel, and an infidel is one who denies the existence of the Father. 
Okay, so this one kind of sound, but over here I'm looking at Google. It says the actual state of being unfaithful to a spouse or other sexual partner. But down here in the number two definition says unbelief in a particular religion, especially Christianity. Um, what was your definition again? Because I don't think it fits either one of these. Uh, just one who denies the existence of God. And, you know, we said in the Muslim um, religion, they always calling people infidels and infidel this infidel that and that's uh a person who's not a muslim right well a person who who doesn't believe in allah the the quran talks about being an infidel all the time um but it's basically a person who doesn't believe in god you know that's that's an infidel so it'd be like an atheist an atheist would be an infidel right okay now we can easily see how that's going to be detrimental to our future is because we are reliant on him to get us through the tribulation. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of people who want to blame the father for the tribulation. But it's not his fault of the, all of these events that's taking place. He's just the one who told us about them. Right. He told us that they were coming. And he even gave us some instructions on how to get through it. And if we don't have faith in him, then we're not going to have faith in his instructions. And we're not going to survive the tribulation. Simple as that. Yeah, if you don't believe that there is a father, then how can you um, have faith in, in him and uh, rely upon him? Right. right. And the last of the four is pleasure. Pleasure. And I have an agreeable sensation or emotion, gratification and enjoyment. When it comes to pleasure... Um, I'm looking here at the definitions on Google, a feeling of happy, a, a feeling of happy satisfaction and enjoyment. Some of the other words he uses are happiness, delight, joy, uh, rapture, satisfaction, gratification, fulfillment, or contentment, enjoyment. So a first person who's full of pleasure is, is not going to want to walk along this path that involves uh, the lack of pleasure. <laughs> Yeah, it involves uh, denial. Yeah, denial and, and 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 stuff like that. Yeah, whereas now we're having to abstain from stuff. Now we're having to do without sometimes. Now we have to, you know, you remember it talks about how you know a lot of individuals are white and round, round because they have a lot of the worldly stuff still attached to them. And how that worldly stuff has to be parsed away and removed from their life in order for them to become useful, in order for them to fit in the tower. Well, a person who is full of pleasure or a pleasurable person is not going to be willing to stand up for losing their materialistic stuff so quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they're going to fight against it. And when, you know, they start to see themselves losing anything, you know, they're going to, they're, some of them are going to lose their faith over that. Yeah, like taking on the mark uh you know, rather than giving up their things, they rather, you know, take on the mark. Yeah, they yeah, you're right, rather do what what's necessary in order for you know, for them to keep their stuff. And according to the script a lot of the scriptures I read, they're gonna they're gonna have the choice one day, either give up all your stuff, give up all your lifestyle and your worldly possessions, uh, or you're going to have to take on the mark of the beast in order for you to keep them. So they're going to have to have a choice. And a pleasurable person, they're, they're going to be in that line to get that mark. And the rest which follow are called thus. Sadness, malice, lust, anger, lying, foolishness, pride, and hatred. The servant of God which carries these spirits shall see indeed the kingdom of God, but he shall not enter into it. Now, when we're talking about the kingdom of God, you could be talking materialistically, or you could be talking about a spiritual kingdom. Now, the spiritual kingdom has been available for us since Yahushua HaMashiach walked the earth. If you remember in his sermon when he first started talking there, it's the first thing he told us was the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or the kingdom of God is at hand. It's been here the whole time. It's kind of like a state of mind. And then the other, the materialistic kingdom actually starts after the tribulation, that thousand year reign where the father is the king of the planet for, for you know, the, for a thousand years. Either way, the servant of God, the servant of God will be able to see these kingdoms, will be able to, to come close to them, 
but if they have on any of these traits here, they actually won't be able to live there or stay there. Sort of like when Moses uh, was bought to take a look at the promised land, but he wasn't able to go into it. Right, so he was able to see it, but he wasn't able to go there. And the thing about it is because, you know, a lot of these traits, like the ones we've already talked about before we've already talked about, they're going to get in in the way of our ability to 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 live in these in that type of environment. Mm -hmm. yep. And the first is sadness. All right. Now, what do you have for a definition of sadness? We ain't gonna spend too much. Let's not spend as much time on the definitions as we did before. Okay. So, uh, depressed and sorrowful. So you say, well, how is sadness going to interfere during the tribulation? Well, you know, what I think of is the way sadness has an effect on you. When you're sad, it kind of takes you out of your game and makes it to where you, you, you don't really have any actions. You, you, a sad person is not really doing much. You know, they're sitting down pouting or having a pity party or, you know, woe is me. Woe is me. Whereas, you know, it, they will have to put off that sadness in order to get up and go do something. And there's going to be a lot of times during the tribulation when we're going to have to be sticking and moving, shooting, moving, and communicating. And if the person is sad, he over there under that tree, he may be the first one to get killed. Or left behind. Or left behind, you know. Or, you know, it, it, and the thing about sadness is it's contagious. Like some of these other ones, like anger and stuff is contagious. And, you know, he may even find himself shunned from the rest of the, com rest of the community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Malice. Harboring injury. Or doing stuff against one another. Or actually, you know, harming each other or hurting each other. Mm -hmm. You know, you think of somebody being malicious, you think of them as actually, you know, taking some type of action to hurt each other. Right. You know, maybe it's slandering, backbiting. Uh, or, or, you know, something like that where they're actually doing something to harm people. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that kind of action is going to be detrimental during the tribulation because, you know, people just ain't going to stand for that. You know, you, you, we are the children of God. We are the ones who are trying to put on these traits. What about the guy who, who's not? You know, he don't care anything about these virtues. He don't care anything about Hermes or the scripture for that matter. You know, he's out there with his gun, and, you know, trying to take care of himself and you find yourself being malicious towards him, you know, he's going to shoot you in the face. Right. Next is lust. Longing desire for carnal pleasure. Longing desire for carnal pleasure. And, you know... When I think of lust, I think of materialistic. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I mean, you want to want to expound on that a little bit? Or? Well, I think of uh, both uh, the materialistic as far as lusting after you know the, the scripture even that's one of the commandments that we shouldn't uh it doesn't say lust but we shouldn't have uh, uh want other things that people got um so lusting after your your other people cars uh their homes Covetousness, yeah. yeah um just desiring some of the things that they got um i can see how that would definitely take you um put you in a bad spot as far as the tribulation it goes along i think again with uh with pleasure yeah well i'm glad you said carnal nature because you know to take not to limit it to lusting after women or that kind of uh, physical or sexual lust it could be lusting after food or lusting after you know uh, the way uh, a hairdo. You can lust after, you know, clothes mm -hmm. or, you know, different stuff. Mm -hmm. I think covetousness is a is a big one, and that's one of the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Anger. Strong displeasure. A strong displeasure. So, now, anger, angry, being angry, that's one of the, the floodwaters that's supposed to, you know, take over. Anger, along with greed and along with hatred, um, you can see that one now getting a lot of people in trouble as, you know, they get into fights or, you know, huge arguments and such. And during the tribulation, that's going to be that's going to be a huge one. Yeah. We have to be able to put off anger, not be angry in order to, you know, until in order to survive this tribulation, you know, anger is you're going to have to be, be able to not get angry at all. I think you said that that was one of the things that you had to put off. 
Yeah, well, a lot of them I had to put off, and anger was one of the one of the um, one of the ones I struggled with the most, is because I thought I was supposed to be angry. You know, they don't call me in to fight for nothing. You know, <laughs> I do like to fight. You know, and and you know, and a lot of the fights that I've gotten in over my life, especially my early life, was due to at being angry or whatever. You know, that's probably how I learned to fight in the first place. And anger was a part of my life. You know. Um, it's just, it's just now within the last few years that I'm realizing that, what, I'm not supposed to be angry? You know, if somebody does something to me, I'm not supposed to be angry? Yeah, that, that was one of the ones I'm having to learn. Next is lying. Anything that deceives or creates a false impression. Now, you know how, now, when I think of lying, in this, in this context, I always think of the scripture and how, you know, um, there are certain um, lies being taught as church doctrine, basically mistruths being taught, you know, down in our churches. And that stuff is going to lead people astray. Like you, they're telling them that you don't have to pay attention to the Mosaic laws. You don't have to pay any attention to the, to the statutes or the Sabbath day or any of that stuff. Those are deadly lies. It's going to get a lot of people in trouble. But you think about just lying on your neighbor or something like that. That's going to end up getting people in the fights and, you know, different stuff's going to happen just just from lying, you know, about people or whatever. Bearing false witnesses. Bearing false witnesses and such. And and then you could then you have to realize that we are going to be dependent on the angels to help us survive the tribulation. How many of them are going to hang around when we're lying? Right. You know, so that's going to push these and, and a lot of the and a, that's the problem with a lot of these negative virtues is that they're going to push the angels away. The angels who 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 are supposed to be around helping us, they're going to push them away and are actually going to attract some of those demons mm -hmm. like anger and lust and mm -hmm. you know, maliciousness. That's going to, you know, attract demons. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about it like that, but that's true. Yeah. Foolishness. Deficient in understanding. Deficient in understanding, basically doing crazy stuff based on, you know, a lack of understanding of the scripture, I would believe. But, you know, you think, okay, you're out there, you're in the heat of the battle, the tribulation is hot and heavy, you're trying to survive. For you to do something foolish in that time period is going to be detrimental. I mean, you know. Uh, imagine a guy who stands up and says, hey, we're over here, you know what I'm saying, is it going to end up just getting everybody killed, a foolish act or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that's, that's, that's a virtue. That's something that's, that, you know, we have to put off in order to survive. We have to put off foolishness. Next is pride, arrogance, undue sense of one's own superiority. Yep. Now, this one is easy uh, easy to realize how it can hurt us during the tribulation because uh, pride and arrogance gets in our way of our understanding. That's why, you know, somebody like me have to bring you the Shepherd of Hermes, maybe even bring you the Third Testament of the Bible. I think we're still the only ones doing classes on it, but it's because... The arrogance of the Reverend Pastor Deacon Dr. Doug interferes with that. You know, I can't count how many times I've gone down to, you know, down to the church and try to tell these guys, you know, you, you got the Third Testament of the Bible, or you got the Shepherd of Hermon, or you got Enoch. And they look at me like, who are you to tell us about this? You, you ain't nobody. You know, mm -hmm. we got all that we need. And so they don't never pick up on this information. They don't never get it. And so at the end of the day, it is their arrogance that has prevented them from learning what they need to know. Like the kingdom, like the like the uh, word said a few minutes ago, they may see the kingdom of heaven, but they ain't gonna be able to enter in. No, can't go in. Their pride is gonna prevent that. And the last is hatred, a bitter dislike, animosity. Yeah, I think I think the uh, New Testament equivalent of hatred was almost like murder when you live, read the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and some of those floodwaters are going to be hate. The floodwaters of hate are going to kill a lot of, of people, you know, 
as we as the world starts to lose more and more faith in the father they're going to start picking up more and more hatred towards one another to the point that they're going to start killing each other and remember after the tribulation there will be no wickedness on the planet all wicked people will be dead and you could imagine all the hateful people out there in the world just fighting each other you know just fighting and killing one another you know the one kills this one and then somebody comes and kills that one i mean Hate is, hate is going to, I guess it's, it's called one of the floodwaters. It's going to be real bad. Yeah, and these um, these attributes are important to the tribulation. Why are they not important for us to be living today? They are important for us to li be living today, but the thing is, you got to understand what's going on here. You, At one point, the whole world was under the... Uh, powers of the 12 uh, virtues they were under the under the 12 virgins they the whole world was doing good right at, the, at one point everybody was cheerful everybody was happy right. nobody was lying or doing anything malicious well over time the the world has started to shift to where there's more and more malicious people more and more wicked people on the planet but it's still yet in a survivable place, which means right now I can lose my mind right now and walk up and down the road and cuss me out about three or four people. And, you know, they, they look at me and shake their heads or whatever, but that's going to be all right. The problem is, is that the time that we're living in now, the world is becoming worse and worse and worse um, exponentially. I mean, it's getting worse every day and it's going to get to a point where, you know, I raise my finger at somebody to fuss at them and they're going to blow my head off. You know, whereas, you know, yesterday they, they may have just shook their head to the next day, you know, they may do something to me, you know, and stuff. And so you need it now. You should have it now. But it's just not so deadly. Hatred is not so deadly right now. Lying is not so deadly. I can go out here and make a few foolish mistakes right now and they may not kill me. Whereas in the heat of the tribulation, one foolish mistake may cost me my life, maybe my whole family, my life, maybe my whole neighborhood. Right. All right, we want to go on to the next verse. Number 146. But, sir, what are those stones which were taken out of the deep and fitted into the building? The ten said he which were placed at the foundation are the first age, the following five and twenty, the second of righteous men. All right, so now switching the gears a little bit, we've heard about the virgins. Now we're going to start to hear about the the uh, stones that were put in. Now we talked about this before. Let me see if I can find a picture of it. All right, so here's the first age that he's talking about, starting with Adam, going all the way down to probably Shem are the first ten individuals. Now if you count them, you actually count eleven. I'm not counting Enoch because Enoch wasn't. Enoch didn't die. He was translated. He was so he was never put into the deep. And so he wouldn't be considered one of the the uh, the ten, but I believe so. I believe the first ten that he's talking about go from Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, and Shem, excluding Enoch. And the following five and twenty, the second of righteous men. All right, now, so the second generation of righteous men, now that gets a little bit more difficult. It could include these people like Afaxad and Selah and Ebar and Peleg, which we don't hear much about them. You rather remember that the father told Noah when he was on that boat, he told him when their people, when, when they got off the boat, that they was actually going to lose focus on the 364-day calendar. And they were going to start eating blood and doing all kinds of other stuff. And that was apparently true. You don't really hear about any of these guys until you don't hear about any of their stories until you get down to Abraham. And Abraham had to actually refine the father. He, he was kind of alien to the father at that point. He, he didn't even, you know, he didn't even know. He didn't even know how who the father was, how to reach him or any of that. So where those people considered in that generation is hard to tell. But I think you could count them up if you wanted to. You would have to count people like um, Jacob. You would have to count people like um, uh, the 12 patriarchs. 
and you may even count people like Moses and Aaron um, and different people like that. Maybe David, maybe Solomon, I don't know. Yeah, the righteous ones, yeah. That's what I'm saying. You don't know who were the righteous ones and who, who were not, who, who's being considered in this number. Right. 147. The next 35 are the prophets and ministers of the Lord, and the 40 are the apostles and doctors of the preaching of the Son of God. So these prophets would have been people like Jer uh, Jeremiah and Daniel and Ezekiel, Habakkuk. Um, of course, I can't name all of those guys. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, and I, I wish I had done this beforehand, but I believe you can go in and probably count them out. You can probably yeah. count. Mm -hmm. You can probably count all... Elijah, uh, Isaiah, yeah. Yeah, well, I was going to say you could probably count them out of... Um, out of the 66 books, but there's there's some other books that you'd have to find to complete the number because, right. mm -hmm. yeah, not all of the prophets' books are in the 66 books. There's some in the apocryphal books, mm -hmm. so you'd have to look there. But those are the 35 individuals, and I bet you can count out 35 of them if you try really hard. I bet you can. Mm -hmm. And then, But now the apostles and doctors, now you're talking about people who lived after the Christ. You're talking about the disciples. You're talking about Hermas. Hermas would have been in, the, in maybe... Um, well, Hermes would have turned out to be a shepherd, so he would have been included in these doctors and apostles in this group. Paul. But Paul and Peter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these would have been the people that came after the Christ. Mm -hmm. 148. And I said, Sir, why did the virgins put even those stones into the building after they were carried through the gate? And he said, Because the first carried those spirits, and they departed, not one from the one. Neither the man from the spirits, nor the spirits from the man. Talking about the first generation. So now, <clears throat> what? You talk, so all of those individuals would have had the the traits of all of the twelve virtues. And we was talking about in, in one of the earlier classes how people like Moses would have had all of these. It would have been necessary for them to have all of these traits. If Moses had been an angry person or a selfish person or a malicious person, he would have had a hard time dealing with those two million people out there in that wilderness. Yeah, uh, it would have been hard because there were several times when he, what, I remember one time in particular when he tried to get the father to kill him. Because he was just sick and tired of dealing with them. Yeah, but, you know, I guess that's better than going out and smacking a whole bunch of <laughs> other people, you know, which some of us would have did, you know. You know, Moses, he, he, he would have had these 12, you know, would have had these virtues on. And then you, then you think about the... the um, the the prophets and such and how hard they had to do like Elijah and, mm -hmm. and stuff how hard a time they would have had you know as far as faith and, and different stuff so what he's saying is all of these individuals they had the traits of the 12 virtues uh, from from the beginning like we said a few minutes ago it's just now that life and people are really starting to become evil over the last few thousand years people are becoming more evil and more evil every day yeah 149, but the spirits were joined to those men even to the day of their death, who if they had not had these spirits with them, they could not have been useful to the building of this tower. Yeah, so even if they, if they had for some reason had not taken on these traits, if they had been, you know, perfidious or if they had been malicious or whatever, then, you know, they wouldn't have been in the tower. They would have had to have been reborn again, would have had to have another lifetime in order to learn not to be malicious or perfidious, mm -hmm. and then they would have had the opportunity to go into the tower. Yeah, it tells us right here that they did have these, these spirits with them. At all times. So. 150. And I said, Sir, show me this father. He answered, What dost thou ask? Why did those stones come out of the deep and were placed into the building of the tower, seeing that they long ago carried those holy spirits? Okay, so he's wondering why they came out of water. What it was about the water that, you know, why it is that they had to come out of water. He doesn't understand the significance of the water in this parable. But the shepherd is going to go on and tell him. Let's go on. 151. It was necessary, said he, for them to ascend by water that they might be at rest. 
for they could not otherwise enter into the kingdom of God but by laying aside the mortality of their former life. Right. So this is kind of referring to baptism in yeah. a way, although you think of these individuals, they may have never been baptized, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But it's like they went through this, this kind of baptism, a sort of baptism. Um, I'm praying for the Father to give me some clarification on it. But it's kind of like a baptism kind of thing that they went through, even though they were in the spirit world. So they had, does these two equal our baptism was their circumcision? Um, yeah, a lot of people believe that, that um, baptism is the new circumcision. Yeah, um, basically the, the, the same thing, um, just on a spiritual nature. Um, yeah, it's been a long time since I thought about that, but I have heard somebody say that before. Okay. 152. They therefore being dead were nevertheless sealed with the seal of the Son of God and so entered into the kingdom of God. Because the water, he's going to tell us, is the seal. And these people were sealed, you know, a little bit differently than the rest of us, but they had a seal in, they had a seal too. 153. For before a man receives the name of the Son of God, he is ordained unto death. But when he receives that seal, he is freed from death and assigned unto life. Again, we're talking about baptism here. Now, before a person is baptized, death is imminent. I mean, and we're not talking about a physical death because, right. you know, you think everybody is, is going to die, which, you know, I don't know how true that is. But talking about the death of the spirit, when a person is baptized... In the water, they get the seal, and it is that 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 spiritual uh, element that is born in them that's actually born under the water that's going to give them the eternal life that we've always always heard about. Mm -hmm. One fifty four. Now that seal is the water of baptism, into which men go down under the obligation unto death, but come up appointed unto life. This is what it means by being born again. Is that, you know, well, one of the way things that talk about being born again, that one is the reincarnation part. But when a person goes down, they go down as one person and they actually come up a, a, a different individual. And it is that this individual that comes up that, you know, is never going to die. Even though my physical body may last, may not last to the end of the day, my spiritual nature is going to last for forever. And we all kind of feel that. We all kind of feel that we, you, you know, we're going to live for forever. And but it takes that baptism in order to get us there. Is that reason why you push baptism so much? Um, I, I the reason why I push baptism so much is because I I have heard so many false teachers reject baptism, and I think it's a confusion in the church. There are a lot of individuals who are preaching on the pulpit right now who say something like baptism is just symbolic. It's just something that we do, and I think that's that's a lie. I think it's absolutely necessary for our spiritual walk, and so that's why I stress it is the you know trying to kind of get us back on track. It's not just something that we're doing just to be symbolic. It's not just a right or you know something. I believe we have to do it. One fifty five. Wherefore to those also was this seal preached, and they made use of it. That they might enter into the kingdom of God. Talking about the forefathers. You remember the story of how Yahushua HaMashiach, after he was put on the cross, he was put in a tomb. And he spent three days in his tomb. But the story goes is that he went down into Sheol, he went down into Hades, and he got these people out. Well, that place where he was down it was at, these people were somehow already receiving the seal down there. And then he goes on to talk about how the apostles, when they were, when they died, Peter, Paul, Stephen, and those guys, when they were died and, and when they were killed, and they went down um, into the grave, they were also preaching the seal, and they brought people out too. And that's what he's talking about, how they were sealed uh, in the spirit world. 156. And I said, why then, sir? Did these forty stones also ascend with them out of the deep, having already received that seal? See, Hermes is trying to understand, you know, what we're talking about here. Um, 
how these people are sealed in the afterlife, how they're sealed in the spirit world. Whereas the ones of us who are alive have to go in actual water. These guys, they it was like they was baptized in the spirit world, and Hermes is trying to get a grasp on it. 157, he answered, because these apostles and teachers who preached the name of the Son of God, dying after they had received his faith and power, preached to them who were dead before, and they gave this seal to them. Now, this is one thing that I'm learning here in the Third Testament, in this third era, is that the people in the spirit world actually hear the... the uh, the, the teachings of the scripture, they actually even hear us now. You know, um, the guys that are that are in the flesh and teaching truth, our messages are actually reaching those in the spirit world. Those that are awake in the spirit world can actually hear our messages. And then when they come back, they will have learned lessons from us, which is a unique thought. It's kind of strange to think about, but, you know. Um, if it wasn't for the scripture, I guess we wouldn't have anything to think about. So, 158. They went down, therefore, into the water with them, and again came up. But these went down while they were alive, and came up again alive. Whereas those who were before dead went down dead, but came up alive. I believe that it's saying that when it's talking about alive, it's talking about, not talking about physically alive, it's talking about spiritually alive. And so it said, but those went down while they were spiritually alive and came up again alive, whereas those who were dead, of our forefathers before, went down dead but came up spiritually alive. I think you're right. Yeah. All right, let's go on to the next section. Next one. 159. Through these, therefore, they received life and knew the Son of God, for which cause they came up with them and were fit to come into the building of the tower and were not cut but put in entire because they died in righteousness and in great purity. Only this seal was wanting to them. Okay, so... They were, they had on the 12 virtues, it's just that they were lacking this seal, but the apostles and the teachers who, like you said, were spiritually alive, went down into the grave, they, they basically ascended into the spirit world, where they started communicating the Son of God to uh, the forefathers who were already there in the spirit world, basically giving them the seal in the spirit world so that they can then come back up well they weren't they didn't come back to life they weren't reincarnated they was actually taken right into the tower mm -hmm. and so all of them went into the tower together mm -hmm. okay all right and the last of this section is 160 which says thus you have the explanation of these things all right guys i'm glad you made it through it um the next classes should go a little bit faster as we've completed all of the definitions of these words we're almost finished with this chapter of the shepherd of hermits almost finished with the book so go ahead and leave a comment um if you will hit that like button to show support for our channel we really do appreciate it you know some people are not as accepting of the truth of the scriptures as others and those individuals sometimes show a lot of unsupport so maybe you guys who are getting some out of these lessons maybe you can go ahead and show a little bit of support for our channel by uh, leaving a comment or just pushing a like button or maybe sharing the video or something either way guys we love you and stay in the fight